Welcome everyone to another episode of Deconstructed. And we have an incredible human being who'll be joining us here in a minute, if you will. Uh, let me just do some brief introductions of myself and give a little bit of, of context setting. Uh, I am a, uh, if you will, business coaching consultant. I focus on business transformation and change, partner with really organizations to help them calibrate their business models and operating models for impact. I look at myself as, as fundamentally a catalyst in helping all that happen and helping really clients embrace, as I like to say, the sacred triad. Reality itself, if you will, and who they are relative to that reality, their own very nature, human nature, and their identity. And we'll definitely talk about identity today with, with Roland. Uh, they do that in order to ensure their aliveness to achieve the maximum impact through their own awareness. So uh, let me just share a little bit about Roland before I invite him in, if you will. Uh, a, tre a tremendous human being to start off with who has had an illustrious path and journey along the way. What really grabbed me and went straight to my heart is when the man said, if you will, he likes exploring and playing at the edge because that's where things happen. So absolutely tremendous to, opportunity to have the fine gentleman uh, with us today. A few more things before I invite him, and I will not be able to do him justice. I, I, I precursor that. Uh, Drucker Senior Fellow, of course, founder and chairman of the, the Center for the Future of Organizations, author, keynote speaker, advisor, publishing, uh, and, and particularly uh, developing leaders quarterly is a, is a key area. Publishing, teaching, speaking, he does it all. Orchestrating networks of executives and peers and what have you, absolutely tremendous. Again, he likes to explore, and I love the word that he uses. I love to explore, he says, boundaries and play at the edge, as these are the places of discourse and innovation in life. And I couldn't agree more. With that much said, I welcome Roland into the conversation. <laughs> I don't even know what to say, Sai. That's a friendly introduction. I cannot believe it. Thank you so much. The pleasure is ours. Welcome, yeah. my good friend. Who, so to help the audience really understand who is the, the man, if you will, respectfully, behind what I just described. Who is Roland? Well, that's a very difficult question. Who is Roland, right? Who are we? My, I can give you a little bit of a professional background. You know, my, my original training is really in political science and social philosophy. As I'm not a business guy originally, right? And I come out of Austria where I lived until I was 40. And then I lived, uh, I, I moved to the United States um, to teach at USC and eventually got stuck here, got a house, you know, and kids and uh, the rest is history. I'm now since uh, eight years actually with the Drucker School of Management where I run this Center for the Future of Organization, as you mentioned. We try to be a kind of, it's kind of a sandbox for me to do things that really are close to my heart. It's primarily research on issues about the future of organization and leadership of uh, the 21st century, which is a quite challenging topic, actually. And I have to say that my background in political science, international relations and stuff like that comes quite handy. It comes in quite handy here, right? Because we live in these times where organizations, of course, also have a responsibility in business and society, which, by the way, uh, was always a very important principle of Peter Drucker, who said, you know, you got to be an ethical organization and you have a responsibility to contribute. Yeah, I've got two kids. One is in film school. The other is still uh, at high school. Yeah. And I'm happy to be here. Uh, you've said so many things. So you're, you're, you're to, right. Let's jump right into the topic, I suggest, right? Definitely. Roland, as we get into the topic, there's one thing that I would love for you to comment on, just kind of as, a, as especially it'll paint the picture, the, the impact of, of political science and philosophy and that mix and the perspective that you bring to the table. How, how have you leveraged sort of those roots to really drive the innovations that you fostered? Now, we've got to be careful not to become too theoretical here, right? Yeah. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think for me, it was really important to have that uh, fundamental education on humanity, social science, you know, and, and, and actually epistemology, right? The paradigms really yeah. of inquiry. I um, hope that's not too <laughs> abstract okay, here, okay. right? But for instance, uh, critical theory was very important for me. Uh, you know, that means th the principle to really ask questions and, yeah. you know, don't take given structures or normative systems as a given. Uh, that was really a very uh, important learning. And, you know, if you have it in your DNA, it helps you a lot uh, to understand transformation and things like that. I mean, there are a few uh, 
epistemological principles, and I don't know how, how well the audience knows them, but symbolic interactionism, for instance, or constructivism is where, you know, things are constructed in interaction, in dialogue, which leads me a, a lot to this issue of managing across boundaries, right? Because uh, as you mentioned in the introduction, I like to really live at the edge or I love edges. <laughs> There's a very interesting book recently came out, by the way, by, by a philosopher from American University called Perry Zern and his and his brother on um, uh, curiosity. And he defines curiosity as something, you know, where you are at the edge, building new connections into new edges, right? So uh, there is a big link to these boundary kind of things and constructivism helps you here. So, I mean, there's a lot of elements that, that really contributed to that. Well said, very well said, my good friend. So definitively, I mean, from your vantage point, we talk about business ecosystems, maybe starting there, you know, how do you define and, and really approach business ecosystems? And then we'll go into the leadership aspect of it as well. Ron. Yeah, I mean, you know, we maybe before I do into this, you know, how did I even get into this topic, right? Yeah. I mean, uh, today it's a hot topic. We did this about two years ago, starting working on that. And, and the reason was we did a project at the center uh, about uh, digital transformation challenges in large and complex organizations. You know, we interviewed C-suite of companies that more have more than 100,000 people. And, you know, these companies are really typically stuck, uh, you know, very much because of their size and existing business models. But they also have a lot of resources where they can really explore and go and try to innovate on their fringes. And one of the more interesting things that came out is that digital technology really enables now that kind of branching out into totally new arenas that you were not actually used before. A lot of digital transformation, of course, is cost optimization, you know, optimizing processes. Uh, uh, CEO of Siemens uh, maintenance back then of energy said, well, you know, we have a bucket. It's just saving money. Digitalization helps save money. But he also said, you know, there is something where we can make, uh, you know, uh, new products uh, and enhance them. And then the third bucket really was totally radically innovate businesses and business models. And that really, of course, catches the interest of everybody. And here you go into the ecosystem kind of thing, because the radical innovation of business models requires usually, or not usually, but very often, you know, jumping across your industry boundaries, jumping mm -hmm. across the cognitive frameworks you have and engage with partners you actually probably wouldn't engage in if you would stay in your current business model. So the ecosystem thinking was very much driven through the you know, importance of digital transformation. And so we got into that. Um, how would I define it? Yeah, I mean, you know, I read a lot of platform stuff before that, and uh, a lot of people always talked about the Airbnbs and the Ubers and, you know, these kind of platform uh, businesses that have double-sided or even multi-sided markets and called them the ecosystem. Now, I actually would even step further back and say, well, we have always lived in an ecosystem. Yep. Uh, it's not that this is something new. It's just that digital technology today allows us to, uh, in a way, treat these ecosystems in a very different way. Uh, we can now share data, we can horizontalize and collaborate across these boundaries that I mentioned before. And this has become really, really easy. And that is something which was not possible uh, in the olden days. So in the olden days, ecosystems were treated in a way, I would say, not very uh, effective, very linear uh, in the traditional thinking of, you know, supply chains and value chains that are linear. You know, you have a uh, you have an idea, uh, you do research and development, you try to throw it out to the market, you hope the customer buys it, and it's a linear process, and you try to align your organization along these lines. Um, in an ecosystem thinking and approach, you, you understand the horizontal connectedness between these stakeholders that are out there, that the, the suppliers, that could be customers, of course, uh, obviously some strategic partners you may need, um, you know, license holders, whatever. And that whole universe of stakeholders, it includes regulators, by the way, as well, that sh that shapes a dynamic system, which is not that easy to govern. Like you would have a linear thinking, oh, I'm in the center of the universe as the company, and now I can govern, I can squeeze my suppliers, you know, I can squeeze my customers to maximize my profit. That works in a linear system. It doesn't work that well in a horizontally networked system. So... 
I would define uh, business ecosystems as this collaborative architecture of stakeholders that jointly create value and that form in a way a meta organization, right? It's an organization of organizations, yep. so to say. And so you can actually apply a lot of principles from organizational theory also in understanding ecosystems. It's just that ecosystems are missing some of the very, very fundamental ingredients we're used to uh, in the 20th century organization. Very well said. And I, and I have to be very honest with you. I've, I've been doing transformation work for over 40 years and my secret sauce has been ecosystem thinking. And I've, I've wrote and written about it, shared it. But exactly to your point, if you're at this stage of the game, it's more than it's more than an, an, a, a want. It's, we have to do it. It's essential for where we are. In, in yeah, history. you cannot escape it anymore. And yeah. that's exactly right. Right. Because, you know, we already talk about data driven organizations, for instance. Right. We talk about uh, customer centricity. Yeah. Right. We, we talk about all these things that really belong into the sphere of ecosystems. Yeah. Right. If you share data, I mean, you cannot. You cannot escape the ecosystem logic. And as you mentioned before, you know, and you asked before, you know, how did your upbringing inform what you do? Of course, systems theory, right, is one of the major cornerstones of, of uh, anyway, social and societal theories. So, of course, I was also breathing systems theory a lot when I grew up in, you know, my political science and, uh, and uh, um, uh, social philosophy environment. Definitely, my friend. So kind of continuing sort of the thread, if you will, business ecosystem leadership. And, you know, we can pull up the framework as well and kind of just introduce it to our audience a little bit. So they have a little bit of context, if you will, around how you, you approach it and define it, if you don't mind, Roland. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. That's totally fine. So, you know, we came up with the notion of business ecosystem leadership. Uh, as something which is more an organizational capability almost than a people capability, right? How do you lead in an ecosystem? And then the notion of leadership is a very different one than, you know, the command and control notion of leadership, obviously, right? Because you do not control the stakeholders in an ecosystem the same way you control them maybe, or you can control them in a traditional organization. And leadership is meant more as something where I have the ability to influence and co-shape the system, right? Uh, obviously, you know, you could be a very powerful orchestrator, you know, and everybody depends on you, and then you can lead an ecosystem possibly in a traditional way, right, of just calling the shots. But that's not really what an ecosystem is about. And we can talk later maybe also about the downside if you apply that kind of, uh, you know, uh, philosophy or this kind of approach because uh, you totally cannot then leverage the potential of the power that is within an ecosystem. So leadership really is a horizontal discipline. Uh, leadership is something that means influencing and co-shaping. The co is very important here. But in order to be able to do that, you know, you need quite a few capabilities that are not very common today in organizations so that actually need, uh, to, de need to be developed. So uh, this is how we came about the, the, the uh, leadership notion of of business ecosystems. Um, we have, of course, you know, a, a connotation of leadership is always something linked to a person. And obviously people, of course, you know, they make up organizations. You mentioned before the human centric approach that you have in your work. So obviously there are people and their mindsets and, you know, and, and, and the way they deal with the stakeholders and the uh, of, of these ecosystems are very important, right? So there is, of course, something on leadership but it's not that, that is people centered, but it's really without the organizational capabilities that are, as I pointed out in that um, chart that you pulled up here, that are both strategic, organizational and relationship based. Uh, without an organizational institutionalization of these things, it's very hard to do. So um, this is how we came up with leadership. Um, should we walk through that a little yeah, bit? That I don't would be wanna... wonderful. Yeah, if you want to kind of walk us through the categories a little bit, give us an overview. Of yeah, things. I don't want to lecture here too much, right? But yeah, let's have yeah, more conversation. Good. But otherwise, it becomes kind of yeah. As long as you're okay with me interrupting you, my friend, with a few questions as we as we kind of exactly traverse. interruption is always good. Perfect. All right. So you know, as you can see, we, we, we the real difficulty I had right when or we had when when developing this is that it is an incredibly complex topic. 
right? And uh, a lot of been written about it, lots of fluff you find, and you know, how can you really, you know, create a model that is relatively simple? Uh, simplicity is really one of the hardest things to achieve. And, um, you know, I'm not 100% sure if we cover everything here, but we tried to make not more than nine and actually not more than three core dimensions because uh, we also, and we can talk about this maybe later on as well, we're, we're currently about to launch an index to assess, you know, the capabilities of organizations around these nine dimensions. If you have too many dimensions, it doesn't really work, right? And it's a kind of a capability framework. We, we know capability frameworks, uh, of course, from uh, leadership, you know, kind of practices uh, and every organization has its leadership framework, but this is an organizational capability framework and limiting the number was important. And so we came up with these three strategy, organization and relationships. And then each of those, each of those three has another three elements in there. Um, I don't want to go through them in detail. I mean, there is yeah. a paper out there and everybody can yeah. download that paper from the website of our, uh, yeah. uh, of our center. And it's by the way, also available on Amazon uh, as a booklet, uh, but very quickly, yeah. one fundamental, you know, difference of ecosystems is that strategy uh, is something dual you have to do. Right. Uh, and the, the dual thing is that on one hand, you have the organization which you're in, and of course, we have to have an ecosystem strategy. You have to have a general strategy of your organization. And then at the same time, the ecosystem itself also is a meta organization, as I mentioned before. And as such, it also has a strategy. It has a purpose. It has something it contributes as value to a, a market. And so there is a dual thing. And those strategies, the strategy of your own organization and the strategy of the system itself, they only partly overlap. There is always a structural conflict in there. And we see this also when we come to, to organization. You know, the governance of an ecosystem is very different than the governance of um, an individual organization. You've got these dual structures, which you have to mitigate in a way, which is quite important. So starting here, you know, with the, with the, with the strategy element, I, I put on decentration competence. By the way, yeah. it's a kind of a word creation I did almost 30 years ago in an article that was also already about ecosystems where it was a bit ahead of its time. And with decentration, I mean the ability to take, to take yourself out of the center of the universe, right? We have this tendency to see ourselves at the center of the universe, right? I mean, you just have to think of human history, right? We, we had, you know, uh, the geocentric, you know, kind of paradigm where the planet Earth is the center of the universe and then slowly it became the solar system is the center and then eventually you know today we know we're just a speck in, in in many galaxies and possibly even many universes out there but our our tendency to put ourselves into the center uh, makes things very difficult because we define our relationships to others uh, more or less like a star relationship right and not uh, as a spoken wheel relationship uh, other than a, a networked relationship and so the first thing is really you have the ability to step out of that. If you're a company saying, well, you know, you take the interests of the other stakeholders as important as your own interests. They're not more important, they're not less important, they're as important. And if you would step out and see this as a kind of a systems dynamic in which you are just one of many players and you would then say, what is the best for the system? You might see that, you know, maximizing your own uh, uh, you know, advantages, maximizing your profit, uh, maximizing your influence uh, in that system might not be the best thing for the system. Uh, let's take an example, right? Mobility, a very interesting ecosystem uh, where the automotive players uh, who used to really rule more or less the game with uh, their cars, especially when they were uh, combustion engine cars, with a concept that saw the car as an individual product you know that is also targeted to individuals that drive it and uh, so on and so forth mobility today uh, is much much more and the car itself becomes a small element and as we go into electrification and networked cars you know where software plays a more and more important role as we see for instance look at the way tesla manages its fleets 
And, you know, we have only seen the fireflies before the storm to say, because, you know, once we have bi-directional charging, cars, car fleets will become fluid moving power plants, right? So we're moving into the energy industry. Um, we move very much into the software industry. Players who understand software, players who understand sensors, player who understand that whole networked organization of, you know, um, of, of these of these actually elements of this yeah. kind of mobility system, these are the ones who are much more powerful than those who provide the hardware of a car, right? So it's for for a Mercedes Benz, for instance, or you know, take these these big proud brands who had no competition in the luxury segment, or actually this very, very small, very familiar group of competitors, right? You had in the luxury segment. Suddenly the rules of competition are fundamentally changing. If they think they are still at the center of the universe in a mobility system, they're just wrong, right? And uh, one of the big, big challenges players like this face is that they have to develop a mindset where they say, what is our unique contribution to the system? And is our unique contribution enough, right? Who else can contribute that? Can we develop the new capabilities we might need, for instance, in network software management? Or do we have to partner up? Who is getting now uh, the share of the value creation? Is it fair? And so on and so forth. And that is a very, very tough thing for those, you know, in, in the mindset of pride in the mindset of a market leader, of an industry leader, uh, to really change the mindset. So that is decentralization. Take yourself out and say, what is re realistically my contribution to this whole thing? And uh, what is the whole thing really about without taking me into the center? That's the decentralization thing. And I don't want to talk about no. all the others that yeah. lot. <laughs> I was going to ask you a question, my good friend. All good, all good. So, Roland, exactly to your point, I mean, it, it is a shift in terms of the ego to the eco, if you yes. will. And, and it is, and it requires a degree of humbleness, you know, from, from, you know, working with organizations, et cetera. Are you seeing leaders, are you encountering leaders and organizations, because it, it is definitively a shift, really embracing the hard work to, the hard work of making that shift? I mean, I think the awareness is growing, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, we have in many organizations pockets where you really have advanced practices, right? And they are actually really, going ahead, they have this kind of, and, and I'm glad you, you you use this word humility because it's really about humbleness and it's about yeah. being yourself, but you know, at the same time still shaping and co-shaping co yeah. and leading. So it's kind of a not, it's, it's a different type of identity and pride you need in an ecosystem. It's not that you are now just, you know, you, you, yeah, you throw up your hands and say, I can't do anything, you know, because now this is all over my head. No. Uh, the opposite, actually, but it's really a new way uh, to lead, to manage, and to shape your organization. So, yes, we see that. We see this, interestingly, uh, more at the fringes of the organization, at the business unit level, or sometimes even, you know, within the business unit, a certain kind of product level, because the ecosystem, uh, you know, dynamics happen really uh, at the business or even at the product and service level, and not so much on the corporate level. And one of the really interesting things is to see how the role of the corporate center is changing because of that. Uh, when we did, for instance, our study on, on digital transformation, originally we talked to the C, uh, executive, C level executives of the corporates, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and realized that that's not the challenge. The challenge was not, we, we had the theory to say, well, you know, we, we wanted to look at functions, uh, uh, strategy, uh, HR, marketing finance, uh, do they view digital transformation in a different way? And, you know, IT, for instance, sees it as a tech issue and uh, HR sees it as a people issue and marketing sees it as a kind of a sales issue and things like that. But we found out it's not about functional silos. It's about the divide between corporate and business. Yeah. And that was a quite interesting insight. Um, so the, the action happens at the fringes. We talked about the edges before. Yeah. This is where the action uh, happens. And this is also where we find, you know, activities and mindsets that are increasingly agile, you know, that, that co-create with customers, you know, and so on and so forth. The challenge really for organizations, especially if they're larger organizations, is to say, now, how can we support that? 
how can we support that through you know uh, in, to both a technical and a social infrastructure mm -hmm. right um we, we, we're talking here about somewhere in the in the model i think is the operational excellence of an ecosystem right which is i think the organizational element yeah. you know we need here both to make an ecosystem um, efficient and, and and working well we need a tech infrastructure that works and just think about i i remember lufthansa we, one, one of the companies we talked to lufthansa at the point we talked to them a few years ago they had 51 different it systems right these 51 different IT systems were the result of a lot of M&A activity, of course, right, of collaborating with new airlines that they had acquired, um, like Swiss and Austrian and others. And now the big challenge is how do you really unify that or build at least the interfaces so that these systems can uh, talk to each other? Now, that was just within, a, within one large corporation, right? Now, think about uh, ecosystems where you have very very different players you know with very very different systems how do you agree on a joint it infrastructure this is where by the way the, the cloud providers come in so powerful right and um uh, and that's uh, and, and and stuff like blockchain and so on and so forth becomes important um, but the the issue is not only technological it's also social right yeah. so what are the social infrastructure you help to create as a as a, as a corporate center that enables your periphery to engage successfully with partners in the ecosystem. And um, that is, again, something where it's not the traditional command and control that leads you, you know, kind of vertically back from the outskirts of the organization to the center. And it's actually very often a one-way street. You know, I command, you go to the yeah. execute. Um, sometimes it's a two-way street, but the two-way street is also vertical right yeah. going back into the center no it needs to be give these guys not total autonomy otherwise the whole thing falls apart but give them semi autonomy in order to engage successfully with their ecosystem partners and the more autonomy you give and this gets us back to the notion of identity that identity that you mentioned at the very beginning the more autonomy you give them the more they're self-editing teams, so to say, that can do their things in the ecosystem, the more it's important that your company knows who they are, what their core strategy and value contribution is, and uh, have a clear purpose that still, you know, provides the glue of those semi-autonomous units at the periphery to belong to that uh, organization. Otherwise, the whole thing falls apart. Yeah, Because the ecosystem engagement can and very often does create centrifugal forces. And how do you control these if you do not have command and control to control them? Because don't forget, if you do command and control to control them, then you do a disservice to the ecosystem. So how do you both support the ecosystem on one hand and make sure that you don't fall apart uh, as an organization, as you empower the periphery? Beautifully expressed, and you, and respectfully, you're reading my mind because exactly as as, <laughs> as you're quite honestly, because we go from humbleness and awareness to identity, and you emphasize yes. the co piece of it. There's a, a key, the co the co influence and co shaping piece of it is crucial. The question then becomes, with all these partners, Roland, how do the power dynamics is sent? Because respectfully, every transformation is a shift in power dynamics. In this case, it's an even uh, uh, meta scale. Any any sort of other yeah, I mean, that's a very good point, Sai, because, you know, power, by the way, is something which is not really investigated enough in organizations, right? I mean, there, as, as we know, we look at organization theory a lot, you know, of, of painting boxes and efficiency and processes and stuff like that, that put in organizational charts. But the reality is happening, of course, you know, under the water, so to say, yeah. right, where the informal uh, things uh, play a very big role. Um, and informal organization, which means, you know, the influencers who might not have a formal role as, as a senior VP or something like that, but as a, as a socially extremely well-connected and enabling person can shape much, much more than, let's say, a dinosaur who sits, you know, up there as a, somebody who is uh, more or less still administering the old, the old school. Uh, now, this informal organization is you know, from, from power structures, very different 
then the power structure you will find in the formal organization, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, of course, the CEO, the SVP, and you know, the, they, they all can assert formal power, but we know how this works. If there is not an informal willing to welcome that, you know, then you know it's it's, it's it becomes pretty pretty weak actually, even if I have a formal thing. So, so understanding informal uh, power dynamics is very important. I had another, I had a conversation recently, I don't know if you know Michael Arena, who uh, is a, uh, you know, he used to be with Amazon Web Services, he's now with a colleague of mine, Rob Cross, and they do organizational network analysis. And organizational network analysis, you know, that actually makes visible these informal power connections within an organization and also the collaboration architectures uh, is a very interesting tool that for the first time allows us really to diagnose and give a quick picture what's going on in the informal world. However, you know, the data uh, organizational network analysis takes these days is of course from accessible data they have from the specific organization. Uh, I said, you know, how can we apply that principle to an ecosystem? How could we understand the and map the power dynamics within the business ecosystem? Because what they do in ONA, which is the short mm -hmm. for organizational network analysis, is you know they they take data like emails or messaging and, and, and things like that to measure you know who is in touch with whom. Uh, that's not that easy because the systems are closed, right, uh, from each organization. So uh, it's very interesting. I haven't seen yet uh, too much work on the power dynamics within um, the business ecosystem. Of course, you can generally say, you know, there are these orchestrators, the contributors, all these roles, complementers that you have as roles in the business ecosystem, but it's it's not that easy. Yeah. yeah. Give me one example, for instance, you know, um, you work, very simple, a consultant belongs, let's say, to your ecosystem and you hire, let's say, BCG or McKinsey or one of mm -hmm. the big ones. Who do you get as a consultant, right? Do you really know who is the best guy or have you to take, do you have to take from the consultancy, whoever uh, they give you for that project? Uh, are the great guys really available, right? Uh, what do you have to do in order to get to really the good guys uh, that are maybe the best in the field? Uh, let's take it, you know, to another collaboration. It's not the consultancy. Let's say you, 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 you work with, with Microsoft uh, to create jointly a data architecture in an ecosystem. Do you really get the best people? Who is the person I can work with? And so the power dynamics is not only understanding, you know, what the organizational entities have as a dynamic, but it really goes down to the very basis of people relationships that you have. Um, I elaborate on this a little bit when I talk about partnering capability. Mm -hmm. One thing is to find out who is a great partner, you know, that you can you know, do from a strategic analysis of, you know, I don't know who is out there in the industry, who would be the best startup to work with and so on and so forth. Uh, then you find that that would be my optimal partner in the ecosystem. Now, how do I get to the right people? Yeah, let's even say the partner has some cultural fit and I did that due diligence on culture. I still can go in there and I will find assholes and great people in every organization. Yeah. How do I make sure I find the great people? And how do I make sure that the great people work with me and are willing to work with me? And they don't have to just to be great people. They have to be influential enough so that if the ecosystem strategy and organization demands a change where each and every organization has to adapt to that change, that they're powerful enough to be a delegate in their organization to make that change also happen, right? If they're you know, nice guys, great guys to talk to, but, you know, they say, well, I can't do much in my organization. They are not really powerful, great uh, collaborators. Right. So it's a, it's a tricky thing to understand power dynamics. Yeah. And, and Roland, I mean, this is one of the reasons why I really wanted to, to have this conversation and, and further conversations is because there are so many nuances to ecosystems that it's more, it has to be multidisciplinary and multidimensional, exactly as you described. Absolutely. The nuance, as they say, the devil's in the details, if you will, but there's so many nuances that come into play. Well, and if you don't mind asking, I'll ask another question, if you will, as, as, as you look at this space and, and someone says, well, you know, where do I start? If there was one capability that you would suggest people kind of, and we know they're all interconnected, but one capability that I should really hone in on, what guidance would you give, give the world, my friend? 
It's a very good question, you know, and I get this actually asked a lot uh, from companies. I think the most important question you have to ask yourself is your identity, okay. right? I have, who are you, right? What is your unique contribution to the system? And how can I strengthen that identity? Because in the ecosystems, you have to let go, right? If you, if you clinch to who you are, you can't perform well in an ecosystem. Yeah. I only can let go if I know who I am. Otherwise, it's too threatening to let go, right? Yeah. So, so uh, the, the first thing is really, you know, the old exercise, purpose, you know, vision, mission, uh, and humbleness to understand I cannot just have everything in this world. What is my unique contribution to the system where it cannot be made redundant if they really need me in that system? That gets me some power, right? And the power doesn't come through command and control. The power comes through who I am as an organization. So that will be the, the starting point. Uh, the second thing, you know, once I know that, of course, I need some kind of strategic thinking, you know, where do I want to go? Uh, you know, ecosystem development is very closely linked to innovation. It's linked to business development. It's linked to, you know, growth, really, right? Embracing by the way, adversity. I, I promise you I'm going to talk about and fragility okay. a little bit, right? Okay. If you have adverse adversity, you can just, you know, throw up your hands and say, what can I do? You know, let's try to make our fortress even stronger, you know, and build walls uh, so that the enemy cannot come in. Um, let's say ESG, for instance, as an example, right? Like, well, we've got to be compliant. How do we do that? Maybe we can escape. Uh, if we can't escape, let's cut this and this and that. Well, ESG could be also an opportunity to, to really branch out into totally new businesses, into embracing new opportunities that you haven't seen before because the challenge asks you to do so. We've seen in the pandemic quite a lot of examples where people embraced that, where a lot of people said, oh my God, we're going to you know, implode. No, the opposite for many was true. So, so innovation and having this kind of, how should I say, strategic and organizational fantasy and creativity where to go um, is, is, is a second important thing. So where could I go? What are the opportunities? So ideation, that kind of stuff is a very important element in this. Um, and so it needs to be, of course, linked with your own strategy. And then you start to engage with allies, with partners and stuff like that. But before you don't know who you are, you know, there's a certain timing also as well if you if you jump too early without knowing who you are you may become just a pawn in a game others are playing so yeah that will be the next step then strategizing very well expressed and and this is why identity is so core and and if you, if you don't mind ron i i, I want to i want to call out the the uh i think it's a, a blog post that you wrote back in uh january of this year i believe to master the dual nature of ecosystem strategies, ask yourself five questions. And very much so, those five questions are very key, you know, and you said it perfectly. Who are we? Why do we participate, if you will? Uh, what do we contribute? Are we ready? And, you know, how do we compete? I mean, I, lo I loved your, your, your writing there. Those are fundamental, <laughs> quite honestly. That is very kind of you. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. It's, it's, and it's actually simple questions, you know. They've been around for a long time, but they're really hard to answer. And in ecosystem context, <clears throat> they become so difficult because they're, you're not the only one who's asking these questions, right? And at the end of the day, you have to negotiate eventually, you know, value capture, who is going to get what, and how can I assure, how can I assure the profitability of the overall system? You know, I, I think it, uh, in, in the piece I wrote on, on, on this decentration, on, you know, on, on taking yourself out of the ego mindset, we have, for instance, really major barriers for that. For instance, a uh, shareholder value, right? Mm -hmm. It's kind of, if, if maximizing your own shareholder value of the individual organization is the ultimate goal, it's very hard to see how to maximize the uh, you know, value creation of the ecosystem. But the ecosystem doesn't have a traditional owner, right? It's, it's multiple owners and some of them are publicly listed companies, others are family businesses, a third one is a small startup, a fourth one is a university research lab. Each of those have a very different business model, uh, operating model, profitability goals, strategies, 
and so on and so forth. So to mitigate all that, you know, if if everybody's just trying to maximize it because the principle of shareholder value is there, you know, the system won't work that well. So ecosystem leadership needs to challenge also quite a few fundamental uh, principles that we've seen in the traditional organization. Very, very well said. And, and the, the the vastness of the topic brings in so many other other things. If we talk about, if you will, uh, which I, I know we won't get into necessarily in this conversation, but sort of things that I really definitely want to have the next conversation with you around and we'll, we'll mention it, uh, but really kind of the maturation of identity and the maturation of organizations relative to these questions and what they're doing in the ecosystem. And then most definitively, how do we focus on the hygiene of the ecosystem? Because by all means, it is an ecosystem and it requires a degree of hygiene and what have you. But yep. Oh, no, I'm you're absolutely. Yeah, I'm sorry. Please go on. Rob. No, no, go ahead. No, you're absolutely right. Right. I mean, I like the the notion of hygiene. Right. I mean, what what does it take to keep an ecosystem alive? You know, and thriving and developing. You know, and also one of the challenges we see is that the ecosystem is much more fluid a system than than a traditional organization is. A traditional organization, they may decide, well, you know, we 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 enter now uh, into a joint venture, or we we buy a company or we sell off a business and things like that. And that's how they're used to shape their own uh, organization and their own business. In an ecosystem, you might suddenly have entrants, you know, that go in and out. You've got new technologies coming in. They suddenly become necessary uh, in an ecosystem where they provide certain advantages. And it's a very fluid world in which you are, right, with exits and entries happening all the time. And sometimes you don't even know that they're happening, right, because, you know, you control an ecosystem only by definition to a very you know limited amount, right? Yeah. So so it's I think the sensing is 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 a very important element uh, of capability. You know, understanding really what's going on and and keeping the context, having that social life uh, that you need in order. You know, having the relationships. We didn't talk enough about that because I think you know strategy and organization all well. It's all about relationships in an yeah. ecosystem, right? It's all about relationships. Very well said. Very well said, my friend. I, I want to, you know, as, as we're approaching kind of the sort of the, the, the time horizon for us, you know, kind of closing thoughts, things that you would like people to really take away, Roland, from this conversation in anticipation of future conversations, my friend. Well, I think, you know, what I hope to do is our next step now, as I mentioned earlier um, at the center, is we we are launching actually next week, we're launching a global survey on the uh, nine capabilities. And we have developed a kind of a, a, an index where you can measure more or less for each of uh, those where people are, organizations are stronger or weaker um, and where there are the biggest important gaps. And then our plan is to really focus together with uh, organizations who are interested, collaborate with us on the specific elements where we find the biggest gaps. Um, and so that will actually really inform the next steps that we want to do here uh, and, 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 and that relate to ecosystems. So, you know, I would invite everybody, of course, <laughs> this is my, my self-interest, you know, to maybe participate in that uh, if they are uh, in an organization that fits, you know, I'm happy to uh, get uh, an email or a LinkedIn uh, direct message and, and and take it from there. The the other thing is, you know, encouraging if you are yourself, you know, thinking about your own ecosystem strategy. Remember, you cannot escape the fact that you're part of an ecosystem. So the first step is really think who you are and what really is your uniqueness and then open up your mind of being part of the system. It's, it's actually really a twin thing to do, letting go and knowing who you are. And then, you know, engage in something that is really the old world of business development partnerships and you know, strategic alliance and stuff like that, that has value for the market. I mean, we have to understand, you know, many ecosystems started because of understanding a customer journey. And the customer journey is a complex thing very often that never can be solved usually from one provider alone. So if you really want to optimize a customer journey, you've got to collaborate in each and every element in it. If you have a, 
a retail store, you've got to really understand also real estate and, you know, and what have you, not only uh, if you're in the retail business, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, and, and, and stuff like that. And then you have to understand also technology if they buy online and multi-channel kind of things. Many, many players are involved. So step number one, who you are and then what is also your customer and your contribution to value creation, stuff like that. And that's along that journey. So... There's know. some good stuff forthcoming. There's a tremendous uh, stuff for that's forthcoming. And and you, I, I, there's, I mean, you know, I, I mentioned maturity. I mentioned hygiene. There's another aspect of belonging to multiple ecosystems. And what's that really mean? How's that experience? There's such a vast space, Ron. And I'm, I'm really, really honored that you're here. Number one, and number two, really glad that you are pushing the envelope and continuing to be at the edge, my good friend. <laughs> well, thank you, Sai. It's a great opportunity also, you know, I really enjoy, I mean, I think your series is great, you know, and you really bring in interesting thoughts and people and you yourself are, are a, a very avid thinker as well. You've seen these things. It's really a, a joy to have a conversation with you. Yeah, you're very, very kind, my friend. I, I would I would also mention, if you will, we definitely have Roland coming back, if you will. We've got a, a, an event and you can go to antifragility.institute and we've got Roland coming back, who will do the keynote, and we'll continue this conversation. But I have to tell you, it's a vast space. Tremendously appreciate your time and wisdom, Roland. And I look forward to continuing the conversation, dear sir. Okay. Thank you so much, Sai. Thank all you. right. Thank Good you luck. Thank much. you. Thank you so much. And thank you all for joining us. And we look forward to the next conversation on Deconstructed, as well as continuing the conversation with Roland. Thank you all.